last two videos, we've been talking about different themes and general chemistry that will help us understand how enzymes and proteins react in biochemistry. In the last two videos, we talked all about chemical kinetics. Simply just understanding the rate of the forward reaction isn't sufficient enough to understand how ligands, substrates, and other factors react with enzymes and proteins. So in order to gain that full perspective, we have to talk about chemical equilibrium. Do you remember when we were talking about chemical kinetics in a rate and we had talked about how the reactants will go to zero as the products rise to a certain concentration? But we never considered the reverse reaction, products turning back into reactants. To talk about chemical equilibrium, we're talking about reactions that have a forward and a reverse reaction. That means the reactants turning into products and the products turning back into reactants. A lot of chemistry revolves around equilibrium. There's definitely a handful of reactions that can't do equilibrium, such as combustion reactions. We can't do a reverse combustion reaction, just not thermodynamically favorable. But here's a really good example of an equilibrium reaction. We have the formation of ammonia through hydrogen and nitrogen gas. But ammonia can also break down to nitrogen and hydrogen gas, both the forward and reverse reactions. But a reaction being at equilibrium is more than its ability to do a reverse reaction. Being in an equilibrium state is when the reverse and forward reactions have an equal rate. So the changing of concentration is constant once equilibrium is achieved. Quickly analyze these two graphs to show us what it means to be in an equilibrium state. We see in the leftmost graph we have a concentration versus time. Once equilibrium is achieved, it seems as if the concentrations aren't changing. Even though reactions are occurring because molecules are moving around, the overall concentrations aren't really changing. We see in the second graph that we have a reaction versus time graph, and we have a forward rate and a reverse rate, but at equilibrium, they're equal to one another. This is what it means to be at equilibrium. To have a reaction at equilibrium, we want to find the rate constant or the equilibrium constant. We find this by having products over reactants and the products and reactants raised to their coefficients. So you can see here in this generalized example how we have the lowercase letters as the coefficients and the higher case letters, capitalized letters as the products and reactants. One really important note to remember is that the equilibrium constant only works for things in the gaseous and aqueous states, and that the equilibrium constant has absolutely no units. Talking about the balance between reactants and products doesn't mean that they're always going to be 50-50. Sometimes it's 40-60, 70-30, it all depends on the environment and the conditions the system is in. For example, with ammonia, many different things can affect the concentration balance between reactants and products. So the question we should be asking ourselves is, what do we do when we don't know whether or not the reaction is at equilibrium? This is where we introduce the idea of the reaction quotient. Now, the reaction quotient is solved the same way as the equilibrium constant. We have products over reactants raised to their coefficients. But the difference between the reaction quotient and the equilibrium constant is that we're going to use the reaction quotient when we don't know whether or not the reaction is at equilibrium or when the reaction is not at equilibrium because the relationship between Q and the equilibrium constant KEQ is really important for helping us understand what's going on with the reaction. Introducing ourselves to the reaction quotient opens the door to talking about favorability when talking about these types of reactions. Because when Q equals KEQ, the reaction is at equilibrium. That's a good tell to tell us that the reaction that we're measuring right now is at equilibrium. But if Q is greater than the known KEQ, then the reverse reaction is favored, products turning into reactants. And if the known KEQ is greater than Q at that given time, then the products are favored. The forward reaction is favored. There's definitely more aspects we can go to talking about favorability and free energy, but we haven't talked about thermodynamics yet, so we're going to come back to talking about equilibrium and favorability once we've talked about thermodynamics. So you're probably thinking to yourself, we have the reaction at equilibrium, 
everything's good we talked about the math related to it the equilibrium constant and now that it's at equilibrium everything is fine right well not really remember the reaction got to equilibrium at specific conditions such as pressure temperature and concentration what would happen if we changed that this is where we start talking about Le Chatelier's principle or putting added stress on a system at equilibrium so what Le Chatelier's principle is all about is how this system adjusts itself to get back to equilibrium. Now there are definitely a few factors that can change on the system at equilibrium to affect it. So we're going to analyze what would happen if we change concentration, pressure and volume, and temperature. Now when it comes to talking about concentration changes once a system is already at equilibrium, in my opinion, the Le Chatelier's principle for concentration change is the easiest. Just kind of thinking about it like this. Whatever changes we put onto the concentration of the reactants or products, the side of the reaction that can compensate for that change is going to be favored. For example, if we were to increase the amount of nitrogen gas in the system, well, the forward reaction would be favored to use up that excess that we just added. But let's say we decrease the amount of hydrogen gas in the system that was at equilibrium. Well, the reverse reactions can be favored so we can bring up the concentration of hydrogen a little bit more back up so we can get at a new equilibrium. So now let's talk about what happens if we were to change pressure or volume on the system. Before we dive too deep into this, I just want to remind you guys that based off Boyle's law, pressure and volume are inversely related. So if pressure increases, volume decreases. Now let's talk about how when we have a system at equilibrium and we change the pressure or the volume, how it impacts the equilibrium. Well, if we increase the pressure and decrease the volume, the side of the reaction products or reactants with the less amount of gas molecules is going to be favored. So for the example of nitrogen and hydrogen gas coming together to form ammonia, in the reactants we have three moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of nitrogen gas for a total of four moles of gas but in the products we only have two moles of gas of ammonia so if we're increasing the pressure the forward reaction is going to be favored forming ammonia so the percentage of ammonia once we increase the pressure is going to be higher at equilibrium but if we decrease pressure and increase volume it's going to be the reverse the side of the reaction with the most gas molecules is going to be favored. And this is how a system at equilibrium behaves for pressure and volume changes. For the last part, let's talk about temperature change on a system that's already at equilibrium. Now, at first, this one probably seems like the hardest one to understand and influence for Le Chatelier's principle. But we just gotta focus on whether or not the reaction is exothermic or endothermic. If the reaction is exothermic, then we have to treat heat as a product. And if the reaction is endothermic, then we're gonna treat heat as a reactant. Now, once we've established this, depending if we're changing the temperature by lowering or raising it, we're gonna apply the same rules we did with concentration, just playing around with heat being either a product or a reactant. If we understand the concepts and fundamentals of equilibrium, we can apply this to when we talk about enzymes and proteins and how they interact with their ligands and the reverse reactions between the ligands, substrates, and active sites. I also want to take this time to say that I made my first study booklet and it's live for pre-order over on my website right now, talking all about glycolysis and anaerobic respiration. And lastly, I just want to say thank you to the Instagram artist forced mori for making those lovely stickers on the side they definitely cracked me up um, with the puns and definitely the uh, piece of bread well i hope you guys have a great day and we're able to get some help out of talking about equilibrium and some of my content so have a great day